welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the online show where we dive into the insights of municipal political leaders from across Canada. Now, our mission on the show is quite simple. Shine a light on the dedicated individuals who day in and day out work around the council table to shape the communities that they call home. Joining us for today's episode is two-term councillor from the village of Tassis, British Columbia, councillor Sarah Fowler. Tassis sits at the head of the Tassis Inlet on Vancouver Island. Tassis is surrounded by breathtakingly beautiful wilderness and abundant wildlife. The village is a friendly and active community, which is home to about 500 residents year-round and about 1,500 during the summers. Tassis offers very affordable real estate with the amenities found in much larger municipalities as well. Most residents and visitors are avid outdoor enthusiasts, including many, many avid anglers. In addition, Tassis hosts annual celebrations like the Tassis Days and the Salmon Enhancement Derby. Attention Saskatchewan. This election season, Municipal Affairs is hitting the road in partnership with SUMA for the Saskatchewan Provincial Election. Join us on election night for live coverage straight from Regina on YouTube featuring exclusive insights from municipal leaders and stakeholders across the province. We will be capturing their reaction to the results and be diving into what the new provincial government means for municipalities. Plus, this fall, we will be traveling across Saskatchewan to hear directly from local leaders about the issues that matter most to you. Plus, this fall, we will be traveling across Saskatchewan starting September 30th to hear directly from local leaders like yourself about the issues that matter most. This is your election covered like never before. Municipal Affairs, your trusted voice from the grassroots to the government. <laughs> Councillor, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. Greatly appreciated. I want to start, if you've listened to the show, at the very beginning and get to know the person behind the persona of councillor title. So for you, Sarah, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Well, uh, like many others in local government, uh, I was a girl guide when I was younger. So I had a uniform and I marched on Remembrance Day and and I see too how even part of my family members, they were involved in their church and they had, you know, people over to their house and informal um, support systems. It took me moving to a small town to really understand how knowing your neighbors and having that kind of like kinship with people who know you and can trust you and can ask you for favors is so valuable. It is a sort of informal social safety net of Canada and other places too, I'm sure. Um, but I did a talk uh, at the AVIC, A-V-I-C-C, that stands for Association of Vancouver Island Coastal Communities. And before I joined the board there, we had a North and West Vancouver Island Mayor's uh, Forum panel where I asked uh, people who are you know, from Port Hardy or Euclid or Zabalas, the smallest town in BC, um, to be in a panel with me. And we talked about uh how it's easy to think big when you're small and a lot of the people that i met through this process whether they're mayors or counselors has sort of shared that similar um you know boy scouts be prepared girl scouts canadian junior rangers all sorts of like youth or even 4-h you know there's definitely a lot of uh, value in um in you know, getting them young, I guess, you know, and, uh, and learning that we are, you know, I haven't served in the military, uh, but I do recognize that there's definitely a lot of ways that we serve our communities. And sometimes it's formal, like, you know, um, serving your municipal council or other ways to, you know, there's parents associations in your school, or there's, uh, I was just earlier today at a hospital auxiliary meeting. And so there's a lot of different kinds of service groups, whether it's Optimist or Lions or uh, Rotary is another uh, big one that people get involved with. And, you know, like everything, and I think that somebody else smarter than me quoted on your show, you get what you give, right? You know, so we do really um, put ourselves out there in service. And sometimes we learn 
the limits of how much we can give. And that's a, another really important thing. But I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Okay, there's a few things that I want to unpack there because you, you opened up a few doors and I don't know which one to play in, but I want to start with this one. Uh, did you say that you grew up in a larger community than you moved to Tassis? Is, is, is yeah. did I okay? First yeah. off, okay. Then second is there there is many different ways you can give back. When did it dawn upon you that the best way to give back was through the political realm? Was it mom and dad? Was it yourself? Was it something completely different? What where was the desire to give back in the political realm rather than the volunteer realm or like you said the military round realm? I've always been very political, uh, you know, right from before I could even vote. And so when I grew up in a, a bigger city, uh, London, Ontario, actually, I um, I recognize <laughs> I recognize how uh, having you know the sort of bus routes or you know uh, kind of social like community service agencies uh around was formative for me you know like I feel like I had a lot of privilege um with being exposed to that and I also will say that you know um my father was a EAP rep that stands for employment assistance program it's part of the CAW union in his case and that was an elected position Right. So I recognize how um, watching him put himself forward to an elected position and serve his union membership in that position was something that maybe inspired me. Uh, but I, you know, I was in student government. I, <laughs> I uh, always. All I good guess. municipal leaders started out in student council or student government. That's what, that's what I'm learning from these interviews. It's important, you know, like, I mean, we have to learn things in a lot of different ways. And I guess in that sense, I've always been interested in, in power, right? Like the, the power of collective action, right? You know, that's what taxation is really about is we're doing this road together. We're doing this water system together. We're doing this improvement district to have a street light on a dark avenue together. And uh, so being involved in student council and doing that from you know, a young age of high school. And then also too, like I do have kids and here in the village of Tassis, they voted the municipal uh, ballot. So the teachers gave them the, you know, the the ballots with all the municipal people who were putting themselves out there and the students voted it and they know what's up, you know, like they, they understand who's trustworthy. They understand who they want to get behind. Uh, there's definitely a lot of like, I think that in my uh, now, like, I guess, formal governance, uh, which I is not a student anymore, even though I'm always learning, uh, I see how uh, there's rhetoric and then there's like things that people can kind of like get behind, right? And the sort of like uh, orators of yesteryear that would give people hope you know, and there wouldn't be a pin drop in, in the audience. And I feel like that's one of the things that uh, brings me to this. I don't think of myself as, you know, a, a public speaker of note, but I do find that it's really important to understand the ways that the sort of sausage gets made, what roles we're playing, you know, what jobs we're here to do. As a municipal councillor, uh, I've been in involved for six years that means I've been through six annual budgets and um, you know uh, what's involved with that you know many meetings leading up to it and that has given me a bit better understanding of what exactly goes to where you know like when I pay this tax on my grocery bill GST PST where that goes when I pay my property tax where that goes you know, when I pay my utilities, some places have garbage stickers that you get from City Hall and you put it on your, you know, um, garbage. We do have a curbside pickup here, even though we're only 400 people in the village of Tassis, but we used to be richer. I think that that's worth noting. You know, one of the, the beautiful things <laughs> of the small town that I live in now is that there was a boom and that's past now. Uh, we is no that longer the fishing have industry. Mill. Yeah, oh. no, the, the fishing industry is sort of where we are still. Uh, we do have uh, fishing tourism, and I'll get to the tourism part 
when you asked me that question. But, but it's the uh, lumber mill? Yeah, we had a lumber mill. Uh, it was the, um, actually, interesting history lesson. Uh, Tassis uh, is Tashis, that's in the in original language. This is a, the winter home of Chief Maquina. And the summer home is the capital at Uquat. That's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, just at the end of the Tassis or the beginning of the Tassis Inlet, depending on which way you're coming. And uh, Tassis Company used to be, it used to be a company town. Everything was owned by the mill. And so in the 70s, when people when this house was built and when uh, everything else in the town was built, uh, it was owned by the company. So the company, depending on what job you did, gave you a house. And now, uh, you know, we are an incorporated municipality since 71. And so 50 years, we've been on the other side of that, where we're in the public realm. We're not private anymore. And there is a couple instances also of other small towns in BC that were also company towns. Uh, sometimes they center around mining copper. Ours was about timber. Okay. So getting back to the role of a councillor, because I feel like when we talk about tasks <laughs> as a whole, we're going to be in this conversation for a, a bit, and I love it already. You have been on council for now six years. You originally ran, though, in 2014, according to the BC government website. Uh, you came, you, you literally like the last candidate who didn't get elected from the results. Then 2018, you decide to return and run, and you, this time you're successfully elected. 2022, just two years ago, you were re-elected. And I think if I'm not mistaken, you have the top or one of the top uh, votes in the entire community. So the second top, there you go. Mm -hmm. What was going on? And I... And I I did a deep dive and I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I didn't do a deep, deep dive, but I did do some research on Tassis and I knew there was a <laughs> controversial thing that happened 12 years ago uh, that was going on in the community. But for you, what was going on in Sarah's head that you decided, okay, 2014 was the time that it was time to get off the couch and put my name on the ballot. And then what happened in 2018 to say, I enjoyed the experience of running. I'm going to do it again. Take me through that first election and what happened for you to get involved. Well, I moved here 12 years ago. Uh, so I was like here at the beginning of the whatever tumult, uh, but <laughs> it never goes away. It's just a new day. Uh, <laughs> and I um, I'll tell you this, too, which you wouldn't know from any research or deep diving you've done unless you're a personal story trader with me. Um, I didn't even vote for myself in 2014. I put my name on the ballot. I was pregnant with my second kid. I didn't have a lot of confidence that I could quote unquote do it all. And I just voted for somebody who had lived here longer. And that's okay. You know, like I recognize that it took me time uh, after I had my child and I went back to work off mat leave. I was a lifeguard in the swimming pool that we have here. And so again, a different form of community service, one that has, you know, hourly wages, punch in, punch off time, all those other sorts of things that I don't really have anymore. Uh, I recognized that when I was the lifeguard uh, for the municipality's own swimming pool, I still was like previous before I, um, before I started lifeguarding again, I used to do that when I was 16. And then again, as a victory lap later, uh, I was doing things like aqua dancing or aqua fit and as a volunteer thing, just like to get out of the house and have, you know, chit chats in the swimming pool with some of my friends. And so I see how the growing of Tassis in my mind and even in community, communities anywhere is, you know, you're new, you, you're doing your home thing. You're just, you know, I have a homestead, so I have lots of homework. But I also see how you meet people. A neighbor of mine actually uh, reminded me. Um, I don't know exactly when this was in the spectrum. It was before I was elected. It was probably when my now 12-year-old was one years old. So 11 years ago, I went to the uh, community church, the United Church. It was an A-frame church. And they had pancake breakfast on Mondays. And that was a place where a lot of different kinds of groups would mix the seasonal tree planters and then the old timers and anyone else who was 
you know, willing to eat pancakes for a dollar, really good prices. But uh, so I went there just to eat. And then I saw that there was no one serving. So I got up and started pouring people's coffees, right? And that's, I think, the just the sort of putting yourself in those positions that you think need filling, right? You know, that's sort of just um, any person who isn't necessarily invited to put their name on the ballot, but feels like I have something to offer and whether people want it or not, the people will decide at the ballot. Uh, a neighbor reminded me of that, but that church has since burned down. And so that pancake breakfast is no longer oh. one of those like community events that people can really, uh, you know, get out of their own like bubbles with, you know, I, I guess that's a, a good way to say it. Uh, because can I, I, do can I go with... back to something for a second here? Because he, he... We're burying the lead here for a second. Oh, and all you the were time. the you you were the <laughs> very first person ever on my show to ever say they did not vote for themselves in that first election. And you said something that perked my interest, and I want to talk about it. Why put your name okay. for Thank you, bud. Sorry. Somebody's picked up the kids. No worries. Cut that <laughs> out. <laughs> Why put your name for it in election, knowing that when you go into that ballot box, you're going to think you're not ready to do it? Can I ask that stupid question right now? I see how that's not a strategy to win, right? Like when you're going to win and you want to, you know, be the best and you you think you're the best and you think you're ready to to do whatever work is ahead of you and it is an elected thing, you vote for yourself and you don't even vote for anyone else, even if there's five people to choose right you know I think that I understand now that numbers process but you know this is the thing about building confidence in yourself right I, I think that when I first moved to Tassis I thought that you needed to live here for a long time before you could really contribute to the community uh, I know that that's different now I know that anyone from anywhere can contribute in any way that they see fit Right. And I, I do feel like that's what democracy is about. Democracy is about saying, I have something to give. If people want it, here I am. And I didn't not get I I didn't get zero votes that first time. <laughs> I just didn't believe that I had what it takes. And I think that that's changed for me now. I think that I have a lot more confidence in my ability to do the work. But I also know what the work is now. Were you shocked at how many people actually did put their their faith in you, even though you truly didn't have faith in yourself to be able to do the job? Because, like I said, that election, you were the last candidate. There was about eight running, and you were like the last candidate that if you would have gotten a few more votes, you would have been on council. So mm -hmm. as a newcomer to a community, and I, I've lived in small communities – you were you were an interloper for a few years before you were truly accepted. And I say that respectfully to any small town community, but there's always that sense, oh, you don't know because you weren't born here or your relatives weren't raised here. So when you saw the final results and you saw that many people, many people put their faith in you, is that what gave you the energy to say, maybe four years from now, I can do it? No, it was not anything about the confidence that people put in me, it was about being ready, right? I mean, one of the things that many women in local government or any kind of positions of power, quote unquote, deal with is work-life balance. I know that even men deal with that. And, uh, you know, having one kid is fine. Having a second one, oh, well, now there's even more things to do. You know, twice as many socks. And I think that, uh, I recognize that part of my life here in Tassis has been doing like a nesting home thing, right? Where I like have backyard hens, I grow food in my yard. I am really like doing, I wouldn't have been able to get a house anywhere else, I think, because it's a good deal on real estate. If you, if you can remote live, if you could live far away from everything else. <laughs> After six years on council, because you're elected in 2018, like I said, re-elected in 2022, has the job gotten easier to do or has it gotten harder due to the sort of the ever-changing dynamics that is politics in Canada today, whether it be COVID-19, whether it be 
high unemployment rates, whether it be high inflationary rates? Has it gotten easier to make the tough decisions around that table? Well, I think that the nuanced answer is that I understand now more, right? You know, like, so maybe my first budget, I didn't understand about amortization. I didn't understand about sort of like, pieces that go to make the pie or the clock turn like all the cogs and everything and so now six years later I do a lot more understand how the operational plan plans into the capital plan which is longer than our terms right our OCP that sometimes is a thing that's 10 years out right or not depending on uh, legislation dropped at any time. <laughs> and what provincial leaders in power, is. what parties in power, the province dictates a lot of what municipalities do. Well, and I'll say that uh, right off what you said, Mr. Brown, is the uh, local governments, whether they're municipalities like the village of Tassis or EAs, the uh, regional director, regional districts, which is a BC thing and wards and other places, all sorts of um all sorts of ingredients in the soup pot. All local governments are children of the province, right? That's something that I didn't know when I got into local government. I thought that we had our own autonomy as an incorporated municipality, and we do, but we also only get that when we're given it, right? It is mommy and daddy allow us the privilege to have our autonomy. <laughs> so I think that that is something that, you know, there's a saying in local government too, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So I'm learning still. So I want to go back to a quote that you said at the beginning of the interview, and it was the very first quote that you said when you were holding a roundtable discussion with, if I'm not mistaken, it was either AVIC or another organization. And you said, it's easy to think big when you're small. Now, the village of Tassis is a very small community, but it is it hits above it, its weight. You look at the economics of the community, it is hitting well above its weight. How easy it to, is it to think big when you're restricted by what the province does as a counselor? Because you know what your community needs. People in Victoria, people in Vancouver, or even people in Ottawa may not exactly know where Tassis is on a map unless you drew a point to them. So how hard is it to think big when you are small and you have larger communities that surround you or even larger communities like Victoria and Vancouver and not picking on them, just they're the two biggest cities in your community, in your province, mm -hmm. that you can hit big when you're such a small voice? Well, and I've had a lot of success in these last six years. I was a small community rep on the UPCM for the last four years. Uh, that I just stepped down in July uh, so I could run federally, which I did not win. And I feel, too, that I worked at the Fed uh, 25 years ago as a staff. So I see how um, my understanding of where Ottawa doesn't maybe know where Tassis is, but Tassis knows where Ottawa is, right? You know, <laughs> and And I think that it's interesting, like there's a reason why on the back of my deputy mayor business card, there's a map, you know, and there's a star that where Tassis is. And I I understand that we don't have a lot of taxation uh, sort of authority. There's only 400 folios or properties in this community, but we do have uh, the, the benefit of having had better days, right? You know, most 400 municipality, 400 people, Property municipalities don't have an aqua bowl, like a five pin bowling alley slash swimming pool. We don't have garbage pickup. We don't have fire service. Fire service is one of those things that municipalities can do if they are able, but they don't, they're not required to do it. The requirements are road, water, sewer. Hydrants is one of those icings on the cake that you wish you could have. And that's where it speaks to the sort of think big when you're small. It sort of started off with, um, the then mayor of Port Hardy, Dennis Dugas, he like, sent around a letter um, that was about small communities with lower capacity for staffing, for putting their uh, names in the hat of the grants that are essentially lotteries, um, and how 
the standard is the same. You know, the price of a garbage truck, the price of a fire truck, the standard of service, whether you're, you know, you want the hydrant to work, whether you are putting out your house or a, you know, a 300 uh, occupancy building, right? You know, like it's the tools need to do the work no matter how many people are doing it for. And my friend, um, actually, his name is Travis Hall. He's on the AVIC with me and he's from the Central Coast. The Oh, no, I'm going to butcher it. Um, is he Squamish? No, he's up farther. Uh, it's Bella Kula, Bella Bella. Uh, has we it? I think. I'm not sure. I'm sorry, Travis. <laughs> but he says, a big bird has all the same working parts as a small bird. And I think that that's really important to understand because this is still Canada, right? Just because we're small town Canada doesn't mean we don't want a good education for our children. We don't deserve to have functional roads outside, like to our municipality, the ones that Modi is in charge of, right? The the fact that in Victoria and Vancouver, they can, and this was something that um, one of your other guests mentioned, 1% um, of the tax requisition for 400 people is not very much. It's about $8,000, right? So 1% in other places is a lot bigger than it is here. But this is still like, are we the third world part of Canada where we don't have banks, grocery stores? You know, our hospital was downgraded to a health center where there's less services involved, right? There's less um, they, we don't have an x-ray machine anymore. We have to go to the next town over for x-ray. So having had the experience where my neighbor slipped in her driveway and broke her arm, well, I had to cancel my meetings that day because I had to drive my neighbor to the next town over 63 kilometers over a mountain pass gravel, right? So it's important to understand how um, hardy Canadians can be. <laughs> and Love, love that, hardy. <laughs> Yeah. Using that from now yeah. on, hardy Canadians. Yeah, uh, it's really amazing to see how much we can do with what what little we have, uh, and also it's amazing to see what we can learn by, or what we can do by working together. Uh, like Savalas is the smallest town in BC, as I mentioned. It's just over the mountain from us, and I remember when they had to suspend their fire service because. They had a fire hall and they had a fire truck, but they didn't have any volunteer firefighters, right? So it is about the boots, no, the feet in the boots, right? So that's... I want to want to ask one last question because I'm cautious of time and I realize that we're almost at the half hour mark and we haven't even gone to the village yet, but we kind of have already touched on it. But I want to sort of transition with this question. Mm -hmm. I would say in the last six years, we I have seen a change in understanding of the, what levels of government and what they do from the general public. And I hate painting a broad stroke, but I'm going to paint a broad stroke, uh, paint a, bro a large stroke here on the canvas that is Canada. If you go downtown, any community, you'll probably be hard pressed to understand, ask people to tell them what a federal government does compared to a federal, uh, provincial or even a municipal. You work for the federal government. You work for a municipality now. You probably are understanding working on a municipal uh, council of what the province does. So you understand that. When people stop you in the community, do they get us? Do they understand that they need to talk to you about garbage, property taxes, water, or are they asking you about healthcare, education? Because for a remote community, you are the closest to the people. You make a decision, you're in the grocery store, you're in the corner store, you're at the gas station, you're at, down at the uh, waterfront. Do you get mm -hmm. a sense that people will only, will talk to you about a gambit of issues and not just municipal issues? And how do you as a counselor and even deputy mayor tell people that's not your jurisdiction? So <laughs> you have to go talk to your MLA or you have to go talk to your MP. Well, and I understand that people have this, understanding that capital G government, it's the government's fault, right? You know, <laughs> and I see how 
we are the government is just made out of people like you, you and me, you know, like and I'll also correct you. I don't technically work for like I get paid by the village of Tassis to do my one fifth council position in the sense that I'm one fifth of the five person council, but I'm not an employee and I don't have work safe benefits. I don't have the right to refuse unsafe work. I don't have a pension. There's no pensionable hours involved in this. And it's important for me to do this continuous public, public education to let people know that, you know, we do the best we can with what we have. We are faced with healthcare problems. You know, it's the downloading, right? But it's also like, I recognize that there's a lot of things that we can do where it's like the prevention is worse than the cure because we have to uh, we have to take responsibility for ourselves. And I don't just vote once, you know, once every four years or once every two years if we have a by-election or any of those things. I'm in it all the time. And I see how I'm open to changing my mind, especially I really have seen how the experiences that I've had in this position have helped me understand that I have to change my mind, that I'm not um, as fixed as I was in my positions when I first came to this work because there's new information. Like people always say insanity is doing this uh, diff same thing, but you know, expecting, expecting a different, different outcome. results. Yeah. yeah. And, and I do see, it's always a different day. It's always different weather. You know, you can stand in that river and it's different water every minute on your feet. And so the important thing is that, um, yes, people don't really understand that the federal government is the one that's in charge of services like international relations, right? <laughs> or economy with a capital E, right? You know, whether that's global or domestic. Uh, because really, the economy is way bigger than Canada. This is like all the things that I have bought in my life. Maybe not all of them were made here domestically, right? It's important to understand that this is one world and we all need each other in it. We do have strengths in some places and weaknesses in other places. So it makes sense to sort of bring what you've got and do what you can excel at. But I, it's hard for me to say that as much as I commit myself to public education and saying, oh, well, healthcare is a provincial responsibility, but you know, I did move from a different province and it was weird for me to change my driver's license when I, you know, moved and, yeah. I feel like Canada should have one driver's license across the country because I can drive all the way across to, you know, Newfoundland on the other side. So uh, it doesn't I, have to make sense. It's just how things are currently in the, you know, um, reiter the iteration or universe that we're living in. Right. So. I do do as much public education as I can. I recognize that I could talk all day, every day, and never, it never be enough. You, you can only, and I often say this on the show, but you can only do enough public education. You can do it about 90% of the way, but the, the responsibility is also on the residents to know that 10%, right? Even if it is just 10%. And that's Chris Brown saying that. That's not the, the deputy mayor, the councillor saying that. That is me saying that. So if you're going to send nasty emails, please send them to me, not her. Well, this is, you know, not a motion or a policy or a resolution of council, right? <laughs> this, is, this is Chris and Sarah having a talk about politics in Canada today, you know, in October 2024. We're having a BC election. It's like in nine days, right? <laughs> you know, or well, no, it, it's, it's the nine per days. A little bit more than that. Perfect segue into the next segment, <laughs> and that is the village of Tassis. 
as as Sarah just said, this is a conversation between her and I. This is not a motion of counsel, not a direction of counsel, not even a policy of counsel. This is just her opinion and her opinion alone. She has one vote on counsel. She needs a majority to pass anything or move anything. So therefore, anything that she says is just her opinion. That being said, it may line up with what is being discussed at counsel, but Alain, it's still the opinion of the counselor. Um, you are the deputy mayor, correct? Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to address you as deputy mayor in this part. I apologize for introducing you as counselor, but you said deputy mayor. Uh, that's my bad. It, deputy, they both go together. Deputy Mayor Fowler, in your opinion, as of recording this at the beginning of October 2024, what do you believe is the biggest challenge facing the village of Tassus today? Well, I made a long list about the wins. But since you asked about challenges, I will say it's that public education piece. It's that lead the horse to water, can't make it drink, right? You know, there's lots of uh, resources in the world, but not everybody is, you know, you can put try to put the square peg in the round hole all day. And I, I recognize that not everyone is playing with the same libretto or, you know, the same deck of cards, right? Some people are thinking numbers, some people are thinking letters, some people are thinking colors. There's a, so many different levels. So, you know, I can find challenges in all of these wins that I have to list for all the successes and assets that we have in the village of Tassis in the six years of my participation on the decision-making body and the uh, adjudication of public services because I, I recognize that every one of them was sometimes hard won. And also people are not always pleased just because the majority of council decided on one initiative or another. Okay, so there's a few things I wanna unpack there, but I wanna start with this. And it's just a simple question. I would have asked it in the beginning, but we were gonna talk about it now. You have come to the realization 100% of the people of your community are not going to agree with the council's decision on anything. You've mm -hmm. openly admitted in the last part that you make mistakes and you go back and you revisit when you get more information. It's the name of the game. It's politics. When you learn more information, you can admit that you have to go back and revisit an item. How do you and how does council chalk up those wins knowing that 100% of the people in your community are never going to be in favor of all those wins that you want to get? Well, you know, what is a nine to someone is a six to someone else, depending on where you're standing, right? So what is I it think- though? Is, is it though? Yeah, like, I mean, what I think is a win, other people are like, oh my gosh, how dare that? It's not appropriate for us to okay. be doing that, right? You know, like we have had, maybe up to five failed grant applications for our rec center. Uh, we keep submitting them and we keep trying to improve this asset that may or may not be at the end of its useful life. We want to see a retrofitted building. We want to continue to offer recreation services. Uh, we also had a flood last year. It uh, was due to winter right? Pipes freezing and all that kind of thing. And it was closed for a long time. So the village saved money by not having any staff in that building, you know? So it's, it's funny how, again, like to me, it's a loss because kids couldn't go swimming. Nobody could use this gym. Nobody could use the bowling alley. The whole uh, venue was closed. But when you look at it on the balance sheet or the budget, that's a win. We saved 20 grand by just having busted pipes and t shutting the lights off, right? You know, <laughs> so I think that that's important to understand that what I think is success, maybe other people are like, oh my gosh, how dare you, you know? And that's fine, you know, like I want to be seen as a elected person who is always recruiting and always interested in retaining talent is bringing people on board is asking, hey, you're competent, you're logical, why don't you jo join us, you know? And a lot of people are like, no, I don't want to do that. And I worry about why. Is it because they're too shy? Because I'm shy too. I just pretend I'm not because I need to get the job done. 
and it is a person job but you know like I recognize that some I, you know, I could be a writer and I could just write in my house by myself and I have been doing that but I also recognize that democracy is participatory and you participate in whatever way you feel appropriate whether it's just paying your taxes or you you know put your name on the ballot or you you know a member of the senior society or you whatever you know insert interest here you bring your talent to whatever it is you care about and for me like I have a long list of wins that the TASIS council in the last six years has done and one of them the first one is contentious they're all contentious the fire hall we repurposed a building scheduled for demolition that was owned by the school board we are currently retrofitting it. It's offsetting the new building costs by retrofitting an existing building and avoiding excess landfill. It takes cooperation with the school board to do that, right? Yeah. Cooperation is so hard because everybody thinks they're right all the time, right? And they just want to stay in their own corner and never say, oh, well, I never saw it that way before. So but I got a whole list. I so, keep going. If you no, want. let's so let's let's <laughs> let's jump into that part then, because every community has its challenges, and we we talk about the economics, we talk about the public engagement, and that is kind of the big challenge across Canada. It's not just unique to about the village tasses, but there are wins. There are things that you are proud of. In the last six years, what are the what what are the top three things that you look back on? You say, you know what. It was a tough decision, but we made it in the best interest of the entire community. And now the village of Tassis is set up for future growth or future generations. What are those things for you, particularly as deputy mayor of your community? Well, I have to start on the social element of things because, you know, community is about like how humans need each other, right? We're a social animal. So I will say that the the biggest win for me personally, or not for me personally, as like Sarah loves to use this bench, but we did have some benches that we installed. And the point of it is so that people walk more, right? Active transportation, you take a break, you need a rest, you can sit down, but you're walking somewhere, you're out of your car. And this is a community that doesn't have any public transit. So it's really useful for us to expand the trail network and to get more people who are users of it but it does need to be thoughtful and so part of that too that social support is the um, municipality in 2023 made their strategic priority uh, food security and that is not in the road water and sewer purview but it is part of healthy choices available to community members and so with the food security initiative, which I'm the one doing it, you know, it used to be someone else and they moved away. And so now I'm the one who's collecting group orders. We're buying, buying vegetables from the next town over. We're bringing them in. The freight costs are being um, supported fractionally by the municipality with the tool that we already have. We have a tool in place, travel expenses for electeds, or for staff, we use that travel expense form. We say, okay, however many people bought vegetables this bi-weekly period, we're going to Gold River, that's 63 kilometers away, you know, at whatever cents per kilometer, this is fuel for the volunteer driver's tank so that the volunteers who are helping don't get burned out because we need to help the helpers. It's really important to make doing the right thing easier. <laughs> is, there, is, is there exhaustion around living in a small community like Tassis when it comes to volunteerism? Because you talk about the, your your neighboring community with the volunteer firefighters and that they didn't have any feet in the boots. And then you talk about, you don't want to burn out the volunteers who are driving 63 kilometers one way, I'm assuming, so 120. So that's a good two, two, uh, two hour trip, depending on the road conditions and all that. Mm -hmm. Do you get a sense that there is a volunteerism apathy within the community, or do you get a sense that people want to volunteer and actually give back because you are such a close knit community? There's a lot of givers here, but there's also a lot of takers. There's also a lot of need, right? 
So I think that it's important to understand the median income of small towns like this that don't have an industry anymore. You know, we are a fishing town uh, in the sense that summertime, we're not an official resort municipality, but summertime is a boom time. That's when people are visiting here. It's very difficult to find accommodation. There is not a you know proper functional hotel in this the way that other places have hotels, but at the same time, it is the birthplace of coast hotels. So coast hotels started here when other places ours shut down. But like you're you're asking about volunteer burnout, and I'm going to highlight you can only give of yourself if you have of yourself, right? Yeah. Like I can only volunteer to drive to Gold River to get the vegetables if I have a car. If I don't have a car, I'm on the other end with my hand out saying, hey, can you go get the vegetables for me so I can eat healthy and I can give my kids apples, right? Like, it's really important to understand that even in Campbell River, which is the hub for our community, which the vegetables come from Victoria, Cisco drives them up to Campbell River, and then they come uh, west. Um, even in Campbell River, there's people who are challenged with, well, this is my monthly expenses. This is what my income is. And, you know, it's not like you work one job for 30 years and you retire with a pension. It's not like how it was when I was a kid and my parents had one job for 30 years. It's more the, the modern, you know, economy that we have is you work three jobs, you know, two of them are seasonal, um, you know. In my case, all of them are volunteer, <laughs> and I see how that's very difficult to, um, like, the reason why you hire someone instead of just put it to the volunteers is because you can count on someone when you make it worth their while. And, you know, even with the, the gas top up, the fuel surcharge that we collect a $5 surcharge per box, and then we get the municipal contribution and we top up the volunteers for their gas. They need to have a car. They need to maintain that car. They need to have insurance. I have broken down on the road before. And so nobody got vegetables that day, right? Because my tire fell off. So I recognize that there's a lot of, you can only give if you have it to give. I can give you the shirt off my back, but at some point, I'm not going to have a shirt to give. You, you talked about some other wins that you wanted to mention. I'm going to give you the opportunity. I apologize for going down that rabbit hole. It's just it's something that you brought up, and I wanted to get that on the record because I, I think after COVID-19, I truly believe there was a sort of an exhaustion around volunteerism, and a lot of people just don't have the energy to give back anymore as they once did because – I, I don't want to say it this way because I'm going to, I know people are going to send me emails about this. So I apologize if I piss anyone off, but the amount of crap that people had to deal with in those volunteer roles during COVID-19 changed the name of how volunteers work now. So anyone who's out there volunteering, God, good on you. And I respect you and you need to continue to do it. I just wanted to make sure that people know that. Small town volunteers are the heartbeat of those communities. So anyway, going back to the wins, what are the, what's another win that you are proud of when you look back on your six years in office so far? Well, and there's two, and they both center around water. Um, the sewage treatment uh, that we, we had two sewage treatment plants, but one of them wasn't functioning. So we are decommissioning that with grant oh, money. And so it was just flushing raw sewage to the place where we fish, right? To the Pacific Ocean. But Lots of towns do that. Don't worry about it. Um, and we have now have installed lift stations uh, to pump all the sewage from the lower town up to the higher town where the sewage treatment that is functioning and ca has the capacity can take care of all of that. And that's really saved um, money with pump time because now you don't have to run two facilities. It's just like having one light bulb instead of two. Uh, and also, it's helped us to uh, remove redundant systems, right? So that's a, an important thing about saving money is that you're not doing it just because that's always how it was done. Uh, you, like, eventually, at the end of this uh, sewage treatment decommission um, at the lower 
sewage treatment center, there will be hopefully a pump out like a sandy dump for um, RVs and stuff like that. So it's important to have, okay, so this is where it can tie in and you can sort of <laughs> empty your tank. <laughs> but then the the system that was sort of starved for nutrients, uh, <laughs> quote unquote, is now getting what it needs, right? Like this is the thing about uh, biological mechanisms and how it needs inputs and outputs, right? That's how this works. Uh, another one too, and this is a, another very contentious issue, is the flood wall. So we had a flood wall, like block blocks, like Legos. Uh, oh, but oh I, I, Legos. I, I understand what they are. I'm just waiting for the yeah. contentious part because I'm thinking for a community that's already flooded, you don't think that would be a contentious issue. But go ahead, continue on with this story. Well, it's contentious in the sense that not everybody wants to look at a brick wall. Right. You know, you see that in, in New York where you look out the window and it's like, oh, it's a great view. It's my neighbor's house. Right. You know, and so I see how um, property values, especially along the river, uh, might be something that people are chalking up their assessed value to this wall being having like another layer of bricks, another brick on the wall kind of thing. Uh, but also there has been floods in the lower town. We had a detention pond installed. We have a big pump that pumps out the water that is from rain. It gathers in this detention pond. And then when it's low tide, it pumps it out to the river. There's one way valves so the fish can't go uh, into the detention pond. And we learned that the hard way because they were doing that. And then we had to install these uh, one way valves so that they couldn't come into the detention pond when it was filled with rainwater. And I think that, you know, the, the flood wall and the flood mapping nobody wants to understand that the unintended consequences of buying the house beside the sewage treatment plant or buying the house by the river that could flood in a hundred year flood with you know sea level rise and all these other uh, elements that they didn't think about right you know like when you first start to do things you're like okay that seems like a good idea then you realize oh there's reasons why manage retreat is one of the things that some places need to do. Like I think about it too, Vancouver airport, YVR, the biggest airport in my province is at sea level, right? So uh, that's cool for now. <laughs> can I, can I ask a question and it's going to be sort of off topic, but on topic. Looking back when you first got elected, in 2018 yeah 2018 mm -hmm. do you think you would have been able to accomplish all that looking back when you first got elected and you put your hand uh, or you swore that affidavit uh and you said i am now the counselor for the village of tassis and you're now looking at list stations water retention you're looking at these wins of being a healthy active community about volunteerism do you look back on it and go, it seems like we have done so much, but in reality, when you look at the big scheme of what the municipality has to do, mm -hmm. you still have so so much more to do. Well, and when I started, I was like, oh, we need to like divert waste from our landfill, which is at the end of its useful life by having a thrift store. But that's not really what municipalities do. Just like municipalities yeah. don't really do food security, that's somebody else's job we don't do housing you know that's the province's job but if we don't help them do it who's who's in trouble here who's you you're, know you're, you're hitting the nail right on the head there Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's important to understand that the goals that i had at the beginning of this journey look nothing like the goals that i have now i didn't know then that that wasn't my job to be like an advocate for a thrift store that can be a hospital auxiliary fundraiser that can be you know a nonprofit organization that was just what I thought we needed the next thing that would make this town better and it is part of the economic development strategy to make it easier for you know small business to exist here if but, you woke, but it, can I ask this question if you woke up tomorrow and I'm not saying this will happen but if you woke up tomorrow and said 
you know what? Six years is enough. I'm calling it. I'm walking away. Would you be would you be content doing that? Would you look back on the six years and say, you know what? I've left my mark on the village of Tassus and it is better off the way than I got it in 2018 when I was first sworn into council. This is already a perfect game for me. Like I bowled really? my perfect game. Yeah. I, this is, you so know, you hit all your this 300, just... you're happy. You're just walking away going, look at that guys. Well, and at the same time, I'm always looking for people. Hey, the seat's warm. You know, it's, <laughs> it's really important to me that legacy planning yeah, in, and in passing the torch, finding somebody who is going to do it their way, but feels supported, you know, feels like, not that I would go so far to say, oh, I'll, I'll mentor you because I know everything, you know, but I, <laughs> I know more than I did before. And I see too how like, there's more things that I want done, but they're also not really my job as deputy mayor of village of Tassis, right? So I see the need for a provincial integrity commissioner. That is not my job. I'm just here advocating for it, right? I see yeah. the need for um, a lot of, you know, supports for electeds because it's hard. It's really hard work to be sort of the blame taker of all the capital G government problems. And I recognize that I... I'm not everyone's cup of tea and my my own wins, like the, the successes that we've had are not only mine, they're shared, but also like one of the really amazing things that I've seen in the last six years is at the beginning of this program, I joined the watershed board for the village of Tassis. I saw the Salmon Parks, which is a Mauichit Muchalat First Nation initiative they, you know, it was like an idea somebody had who was their biologist, fisheries biologist. He shopped it around to nonprofit groups like Ducks Unlimited and other like watershed type groups. They, they get funding, they get staff. Now it's this thing. And I'm just on the sidelines going, yay, cheerleading, way to go, Salmon Parks, you know? And I see how that's not my win. That's me stepping down and saying, look at you lead, look at you go, look at how far you've come. It's been like, you know, from six years when Salmon Park started to now there's a film you could look it up, you know, and it's just going to keep going, you know, because it's about um, Indigenous uh, agency. It's about food security long-term. It's about land and water issues, right? It's, there's so many layers to uh, the work that I've learned about whether it's on the watershed board or any of the other boards that I've been involved in. And it is a lot of ways a leap of faith because you put your name on the ballot. You don't know if people are going to like you, you know, you don't know if people are going to want you. And so that's, you know, you just have to be confident in yourself that whether you win or lose, you are here to be open-minded you have a uh, you know semi permeable membrane. You're not a thick skin, <laughs> and you you know also know when to echo what other people say. You know I have so many mentors that you know many of them have been on your show, but uh, also people who I learn by listening from. I learn because I get to sit in these smart tables and I get to listen. And I get to hear what other people have to say. And then when it's my turn to talk, maybe I just say what they said because it was the smartest thing there, right? <laughs> I want to turn to my last subject now, and it's my favorite subject. And it is it is a subject that we talked about a little bit at the beginning, but we're going to go a little bit deep dive into it now. Now, I believe tourism is one of the most important things that municipalities have going for it, and some municipalities don't do it. But according to the Village of Tassas website, you guys are doing it quite well, or you guys are a hidden gem on Vancouver Island that you guys just don't even have to do it. And your population triples by the time summer rolls around because you are a wilderness outdoor lover's paradise from what your website has said. And I want to know, while you have many people who come to your community, 
what are the hidden gems? What are the things that you tell people if you come here? It doesn't have to be right in the ta- village. It can be in the outskirts as well. But what are the hidden gems that you tell people if you come to Tassus, you need to see this? Well, and this is a trick question because all the locals don't want <laughs> the tourists to go to their spots, right? Ask a fisherman where his best fishing spot is. He's gonna not gonna tell you. you know? He's gonna tell you right so, beside the dock, right? It's right beside the ask, dock. <laughs> ask a mushroom picker where their mushrooms grow. They're not gonna tell you, right? You know, they want that for themselves. And that's okay. So I'm not gonna give away any secrets. I am gonna say that in the North Island, uh in Port Hardy, they have Palomi Days, fishing, logging, mining. That's F-I-L-O-M-I, fishing, logging, mining. So that's what people have traditionally done in the North Island. And I would say for tourism and for where we are, like we've, our mill shut down 24 years ago. So we've been evolving for that long. We are still a fishing town. A lot of good times had on uh, boats in the ocean here. And a lot of fishing tourism still happens. I worked at a fishing lodge down the road. Mucha Bay is a lovely place. Uh, I recommend it. Um, I also see how we have mountain biking, hiking, and bird watching now. We have different kinds of people coming than we used to. And I'll say, depending on when you come, you know, summer is a hard time to find accommodations. Uh, the wake up in the morning, you're going to stop at the Coal Creek Roasters Coffee Chocolate Bar. That's just on the the end of the government wharf it's um near the boat launch and also if you're in the summer then you'll have the marina you can you know get uh nachos and beers at uh the other alternative in the winter time is the ocean view cafe restaurant mrs sharma makes uh butter chicken on fridays so that's that's what everybody eats on fridays I, I'm and, there next yeah. summer. You and me, I'm doing it. I have to do a big trip through the Vancouver Island to communities that have been on the show. I have been meaning to get there. I just haven't been able to get as far to the island as possible. And who doesn't like a good ferry trip? While you said you don't like to give away the spots of the hunt, the anglers or even the mushroom pickers, is there a spot that you can give away right now and say, you know what? When I need to decompress, this is the spot I can go out and just let it all go, knowing that tomorrow morning I'm going to have to get back up and try to make the community better off than I left it the day before. There's three levels of hiking trails here. One is very steep. Um, I don't take that one too much. I broke my leg twice. But there is the bouldering trail, and that one is um, medium, I guess. And then the leaner trail is the easiest, most pedestrian. You can take your bike on it. So I think that that is the place that I like to go. I pick berries out there in the summertime. Uh, I also, I have become more of a homebody since becoming a, you know, a professional communicator or, a, you know, a public servant, so to speak. So I see how being at home in my safe place in my front garden, you know, that is what I do to decompress. I, you know, I recognize that not everybody's welcome at my house anymore, which that's one of the things that has changed for me, right? You know, it's it's really interesting to grow and learn and becoming, uh, you know, uh, a small town person has really made me more self-sufficient and also more caring about the people around me. So I usually ask the final question, which is the million dollar question, but I have one new question I'm going to throw at you here for a second. How does a girl from London, Ontario, become such an influential force in BC municipal politics and still have one of the most energetic, down-to-earth, personalities I have ever come across because it just doesn't seem like a true London night to be. And for those who are listening from London, and I know you do listen because I have two counselors who listen on the show on a regular basis, not throwing, shade at, not throwing shade at London. I'm just saying 
you've come a long way. Is is your life as a municipal councillor in a small town village or small village what you expected it was going to be at where you are now? I didn't expect to do this. You know, it's sort of the circumstantial thing. I love London, going there for Christmas. Uh, and I see too how having that experience of living in a populated province with, you know, like I didn't, when I first came to BC, I didn't know about MSP premiums. Everybody in BC knows about them though, right? <laughs> so I recognize how I learned by doing and I, you know, I'm pretty happy where I am. Uh, but I also see how this was a huge adventure. You know, it, when I came here, I was a seasonal tree planter. I worked as a, a server in the fishing lodges. I you know, worked as a lifeguard. I did a lot of different piecemeal jobs. And then I became a parent. Then I became a homeowner. You know, I see now I'm a homesteader and a podcaster and a private press. Uh, we have a poetry book that we put together, but we don't really do that anymore because print costs money. But um, podcasting is cheaper, <laughs> at least for me. <laughs> well, I was go I was going to mention that before we go here, but you do have your own show. What is it all about? So that way, those who are listening right now can go find it. And the links will be in the show notes. So you do not have to mention all the links. But what's your show about? Uh, I started recording the Waterfall podcast. It's the hashtag Waterfall podcast. So number sign for anybody who's as old as me. Um, I started recording it when I became the small community rep because I didn't really know what was involved. I put my hand up. I'm, I live in a small community. There's a spot for small community people. You know, I'm doing that. I'm living the life. So I started recording it then. It started off very like 15 minute episodes, super small. Then I switched uh, platforms and started recording hour long episodes. Um, a lot of times it's, I take a lot of webinars and COVID helped. COVID made me be able to do three times as much work for half as much as terms of like no carbon credits were expent on this, you know, recording today, right? We didn't have to meet up halfway between Calgary and Tassis, right? Like I, I see Where how... would that be? I'm assuming that would be in probably like Chilliwack or probably Burnaby, right? <laughs> One of those, you know, lovely places this time of year. But <laughs> I I think that for me, uh I used to be a filmmaker, uh, you know, a long time ago and my social media presence on all the, you know, the multimedia that I make or consume. It's about expression. It's about encouragement. It's about leaving breadcrumbs for the people who come after me. I don't know that I'll keep doing the podcast, um, you know, ad nauseum. I have done 234 episodes though. And sometimes it's just like, here I'm in this webinar about contaminated sites. And I just, record it because here I am learning about you know sewage or blockages or arsenic or whatever and I just am in my home talking to myself listening to you know experts talk about the policy defense or whatever so many different things it's all the things one time someone was like waterfowl there's no waterfowl on here you're not hunting ducks and I'm like so then the next episode I went to the estuary I started stalking the swans I'm like they're not making any noise but it's me and the swans right now here in the estuary so <laughs> I mean that was one of the very early episodes and I have had a couple guests those are the best episodes when I like have a conversation with people because the other ones are very boring right like webinars all the time um you know, it's lectures, they're lectures. And uh, I recognize that people tune me out when I talk too much. So <laughs> I'll stop there and say, it's been a pleasure to uh, be on this cross border. Uh, what do you call it? Cross border? Oh, no, we have one last question for you. One last okay. question that, that I will let you go. And it's the million dollar question. And this is the this is the question that I love when counselors or any municipal leader answers. And for you, the question is, as always, in your opinion, what makes the village of Tassis such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? 
Oh, well, I know that you asked that question to everyone and I thought I was prepared for it. But, you know, I love the life that we have here. It's wild. It's a wild life, right? There's uh, forests in the backyard. You can just keep walking and never be found. That's the Sasquatch is for sure. You know, there's sea monsters for sure. And I recognize how this place for me is me being my my wild west self i am a great lakes girl though so i do want to see some things like shared investment uh public um transport you know I, I recognize that we can get more if we work together so that's another thing that's you know working together live work and play right uh raise a family i i'm wouldn't have been able to afford a house anywhere else. So I got a lot of big house that needs a lot of work. So that's another fun thing. You know, I'm learning all sorts of things like how to pull up carpets or how to fix plumbing. <laughs> and that's, that's where, you know, living in Texas is you are the one you're waiting for. You can, you can do whatever you want. You can learn anything on YouTube and then you're going to learn what you didn't what you didn't know before you started right <laughs> don't 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 let my husband hear you say that because he starts all these projects after watching one episode of a youtube how to and nothing yeah. ever gets accomplished our house is always in a state of perpetual change but never gets finished god bless youtube there is no finishing right there's That's only true. passing of torches right like and when i'm done in municipal politics or in politics in general i do hope to get a real job one day but i see how um, there's this chain of office or there's this like somebody lived in this house before me somebody will live in this house after me hopefully it's a little better than when I got here Deputy Mayor Fowler Sarah <laughs> I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart I know I said 45 minutes and we've been chatting for an hour but it seems like we have just scratched the surface and I'm not sure if this is going to go anywhere, but I hope we stay in contact because I truly, I, I love what you do. And I, I'm, you found a fan in Chris Brown. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and do this. This has been an absolute pleasure on my behalf. I appreciate your time. Thanks for doing what you do. Thank you for tuning in for another great episode of Cross Border Interviews. Now, we hope you've enjoyed today's conversation with Councillor Fowler. If you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an upcoming episode. Your support helps us to continue to grow and bring you more of these important conversations like you heard today. Stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you right here next time on Cross Border Interviews. Till then.